Join us this new year for new conversations at the Commonwealth Club. Well, hello and welcome to today's event at the Commonwealth Club of California. My name is Stephen Saum, and I'm the editor of Worldview Magazine. This program is part of the Commonwealth Club's Fu Future of Democracy series, supported by Betsy and Roy Eisenhart. Other programs in the series can be found on the club's website at www.commonwealthclub.org. I'm very pleased uh, to be joined this evening by Dr. Yasha Monk, to discuss his latest book, The Great Experiment, Why Diverse Democracies Fall Apart and How They Can Endure. Dr. Monk is a political scientist, author, and associate professor of practice at Johns Hopkins University's School of Advanced International Studies. His works have included assessments of American democracy, the dangers of nationalism, and ethnic relations in democratic settings. In his latest book, The Great Experiment, Yasha Monk explains that the challenge faced by modern democracies to be both diverse and equal is one that is historically unprecedented. Using historical analysis and in-depth political knowledge, Dr. Monk contends that while democracies in the past have either fallen short, that have either fallen short when it comes to equality or diversity, there are actions we can take today that will help our institutions achieve this. Finally, he argues that this is not only possible, but essential to the survival of a free society. A reminder to our audience, uh, if you're here with us in person in San Francisco and have a question for Yasha Monk, please write it on the question cards in your seat, near your seats. If you're watching along with us online, please put your questions into the text chat on YouTube. We'll be getting to audience questions later in the program. So thank you, Yasha Monk, for joining us here in San Francisco uh, this evening. So the title of your book um, uh, it, and the origin story of it comes out of an interesting moment that you had in a, in a previous conversation um, where you've, you found yourself um, very much under fire for, some, for something that you'd said. Um, tell us that story. How did that, that come about? Yeah, first of all, thank you for, for having me. It's, this is such a wonderful venue, and I look forward to this conversation. Um, and yeah, I thought that you know the experience of writing a book is always the experience of being misunderstood. So I thought perhaps I'll start the book with uh, the most extreme story of being misunderstood that's happened to me so far. Um, and so uh, about four years ago, I was in Germany promoting my, my last book, The People vs. Democracy, which is about the rise of populism and the threat it poses to democracies around the world. Um, and uh, I was, you know, I went on the biggest or one of the biggest news shows in German television. And I was a little bit nervous because uh, I'm used to speaking about politics in English at this point. I grew up in Germany, but uh, you know I haven't really done academic work there since since high school, so I always feel sort of a little bit like a kid trying to talk about politics in German. Um, uh, but I sort of the first question was about the causes of a rise of populism, and I thought I can answer that. And I was getting less nervous as I was speaking, and I said, uh, you know, it has to do with the stagnation of living standards for for ordinary citizens, it has to do with the rise of the internet and of social media. But there's also a third kind of reason, uh, which is the transformation of uh, mono-ethnic and monocultural societies like, like Germany into more multi-ethnic ones. Um, I think that, uh, that can succeed and it will succeed in the end, but it also poses some very serious challenges. Uh, uh, and so what we're doing here is a sort of historically unique experiment. Um, I finished the interview. Um, my mom, who usually dislikes every interview I give, called me up and said, <laughs> you know, well done, that was really good. <laughs> okay, fine. Uh, I went to sleep. I took a plane to the United States. Uh, so I didn't look at my phone for a long time. Uh, and then when I landed, I switched on my phone and I had just these, uh, you know, dozens and dozens of messages denouncing me uh, and saying, uh, you know, how dare you experiment on the German people? And I thought, what, what do you mean I'm experimenting on the German people? What is this actually about? And I, and I Googled myself, and it turned out that these far-right sort of websites and uh, 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 blogs and, and, and politicians said that I, I had somehow admitted that uh, Angela Merkel and I were in cahoots to experiment on the German people by replacing, essentially, the, the German population with, uh, 
with a more pliable population. Um, and that was a misunderstanding because uh, uh, it misunderstood what I meant by experiment, mm -hmm. right? So as an experiment, which is what uh, sort of your chemistry teacher does in ninth grade, right? Uh, who comes in, he has two liquids, and he pours one to the other, and there's an explosion, and he knows exactly what's going to happen, and then he explains the principles behind it, right? And it's all sort of set up with the outcome uh, very much known in advance, hopefully, otherwise the school might burn down. Um, uh, but what I meant by experiment is what the, the framers of our constitution meant in, in the late 18th century, um, namely, uh, uh, when you are in a new situation, uh, you didn't quite choose to get into that situation. In many ways, it is the unintended consequence of other kinds of decisions that people made. Uh, you're trying to do something novel, uh, uh, and you don't quite know how that's going to work, but you realize that you have to make it work. And that's the situation we're in today, because you have two kinds of democracies. You have ones like Germany that were founded at a moment when they were very homogeneous, uh, and you have ones like the United States that always have been diverse, but which used to exclude big parts of a population uh, from for participation. In fact, exclude and dominate and uh, subjugate parts of a population in the most heinous ways. Uh, and so what's truly novel in both places is the attempt to build ethnically and religiously diverse democracies, but actually treat their members as, as true equals. And that's the subject of, of, of this book. And yet it seems strange to be talking about an experiment, you know, when there has been democracy in some form in this country, right, going, going, to, going on 250 years now. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, democracy was an experiment from the late 18th century because there was actually no precedent for making the self-governing republics work. Um, that was the concern of, of the founders, that every attempt at building the self-governing republics until that time had, had, had failed and they didn't know what was going to succeed. Um, I do think we're now at a new kind of experiment because mm -hmm. throughout those 250 years, uh, you did, uh, you know, the challenge of ethnic and religious diversity was solved by simply saying one group is going to have power and is going to have full membership in, in the nation, it's going to have uh, the ability to fully participate politically, and the others will be excluded. And so what's new about the situation in the United States today is not that America uh, is diverse for the first time in its history, it has been that since certainly the founding of a republic. Um, uh, but it is that we are actually trying to treat members of so many different ethnic and religious groups as equals. And of course, uh, uh, the share of, of a non-white population has also gone up significantly. And so you put those two things together, and I do think that uh, we're doing something that, that is unprecedented and that uh, qualifies as the kind of second great experiment in, in American history. And, and then there are the, the kind of the two parts of the book. I mean, there's the falling apart and, <laughs> and then how they can endure. I mean, in the first part, you know, I, I found myself thinking of, you know, William, William Butler Yeats, right? I mean, like, you know, this, things fall apart, the center cannot hold, right? The, the best lack all convic conviction while the, the worst are full of passionate intensity. Um, you know, there, there seems something relevant ab about that now. Um, and yet you, you make the case for being an optimist in this book, why? Yeah, so uh, the more I thought about this, the more I've realized that there's a kind of slightly paradoxical nature to, to what people think about diverse democracies. So a lot of people, I think, start with a naive optimism, which is understandable, but which I think is misguided. And that's to say, you know, diversity is our strength, and uh, it shouldn't be hard to, to deal with this ethnic and religious diversity. And, how hard can it be to be tolerant, not to be a bigot, not to be a racist? How hard can it be to uh, you know, like your neighbor, even if they're a little bit different from you? Uh, and that optimism then quickly turns into pessimism, even into fatalism. Mm. Because people can then very quickly say, well, despite the fact that this should be easy, look at reality today, and you have injustice and discrimination and all of these problems. Uh, and so there must be something really wrong with us. Uh, and so how can we be op optimistic about the future if, if we're doing so badly in this basic task? Why, why should the future be any better? Um, my movement in this book is sort of opposite. Um, I actually uh, lay out in great detail why uh, it really is very difficult to build these ethnically and religiously diverse democracies. And that, then I think, can actually uh, help to explain uh, or to motivate a little bit of optimism and a little bit of pride about the, the improvements that we've made in the last decades. So perhaps let me 
take a moment to explain why this is a difficult thing mm -hmm. to do, and we can talk about the optimism uh, in a moment, uh, there's basically three big reasons for that. The first is that uh, it turns out that human beings really are deeply what Jonathan Haidt calls groupish. Uh, but we just have this deep instinct towards uh, uh, building groups and then favoring the members over outsiders. I tell the story, I tell a lot of stories in this book. I tell the story of uh, Henry Teifel, uh, who was a, a social psychologist. Uh, much of his family perished in the Holocaust, and he tried after World War II to figure out what it is about groups that sometimes makes them so dangerous, what, is it, what it is about groups that motivated so much of the hatred of, of, of World War II. And he thought, hey, I have a great idea for how to figure out what, 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 what makes these groups tick. I'm going to create groups that are so silly, that are so pointless, that the members wouldn't have a reason to discriminate against each other. And then I'm going to slowly ladle on new features until I get to the point where they start to, where these in-group uh, favoritism, out-group discrimination mechanisms start to kick in. And so he got a bunch of kids from the suburbs of Bristol, where he was a professor uh, in England, uh, into the lab. And he showed them a sheet of paper with about 150 dots on it. Uh, and he said, have a guess how many dots on the sheet of paper. And so some students said 120 or 130, and some said you know, 170 or 180. And he said, great, all right. Uh, I'm going to split you into underestimators and overestimators. And then uh, you'll have to distribute points to each other, which can be redeemed for cash. And it turned out that the underestimators discriminated against the overestimators. And the overestimators discriminated against the underestimators. So Teufel failed in what he was trying to do. He failed to create a group that is so silly that this groupishness wouldn't be triggered. Something as silly as splitting you into underestimators and overestimators is enough to bring out this side of human nature. Now, my students sometimes don't believe me that this works. And so I have a little game I play where I uh, ask them whether or not a hot dog is a sandwich. And you know, my students are an incredibly diverse bunch, which is, which is wonderful. Um, uh, you know, the campus I teach is incredibly diverse now. Um, and they think of themselves as the most tolerant people in the world. And in some ways, perhaps they are. But it turns out that the students who think that a hot dog is a sandwich start to discriminate immediately against the students who think that a hot dog is not a sandwich, and vice versa. Um, so this is one difficulty, right? This, this tendency to form groups and to say, hey, you're part of my group, and I'm going to be really altruistic towards you. I can be capable of great courage and, and, and altruism towards you, but you're over there. You're in a different group. And I'm going to treat you badly. That is just a deeply human thing, but we can't really escape. So that's the first difficulty. Um, the second is that uh, that kind of groupishness, especially when it comes to ethnicity, to religion, uh, to nationality, to race, has often motivated in the real world some of the worst crimes of humanity. Um, um, it's not true in every case, but some of the absolute worst instances of war, of civil war, of uh, genocide, of ethnic cleansing uh, pitted one ethnic, cultural, national, racial group uh, against another. Um, and so we know from history uh, uh, how motivating this can be. And we know that sometimes diverse societies manage to sustain themselves relatively peacefully for decades or for centuries. And then something went wrong, something changed in a constellation. And suddenly, people who were peaceful neighbors one day were at each other's throats in the most violent ways the next day. So this is the second difficulty, the lessons from history. Now, the third difficulty is that as somebody who uh, passionately believes in democracy, um, who made his name by warning about dangers to democracy, my instinct was to say, perhaps democratic institutions can solve all of this. And I think when you understand democratic institutions in the right way, they can make a real contribution to solving these problems. And I lay out uh, some of that in this book, what kind of democratic institutions can actually help to manage these tensions. But the basic democratic mechanism can also exacerbate them. So when you look at some of the most celebrated democracies in the history of the world, from uh, ancient Athens to the Roman Republic to the city-states of medieval Italy, uh, they often, 
uh, prided themselves on their ethnic purity. Mm. And when you think of some of the places that are most celebrated for sustaining relatively uh, uh, diverse societies, from Baghdad in the 9th century to Vienna in the 19th century, they were often monarchies or empires. And that's not a coincidence, actually. Because in a, in a monarchy or an empire, you don't have any political power and I don't have any political power. So we both sort of have to trust the monarch. So if you have more kids than I do, or there's more immigrants who come in who look more like you than they look like me, I say, well, I still trust the monarch. It doesn't really change anything. A democracy is always a search for a majority. And so if I used to be in the majority ethnic or cultural or religious group, and suddenly you have more kids than I do, or there's more immigrants coming into your group than to mine, this fear that, hang on a second, I might now suddenly lose the next election, and that might completely change the sort of uh, balance of, 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 of political power, uh, uh, is kind of natural. It, 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 is, it, is, it is pushed by the political system. And that helps to explain uh, the forms of uh, demographic fear and doom mongering in many democracies today. And so you take those three difficulties together, and you start to realize that uh, uh, the great experiment is a difficult undertaking, but it is hard to make these ethnically, religiously diverse democracies succeed. One of the, one of the phrases that you use, when we're talking about the, the difficulties and the, and the challenges that democracies face, one of, the con one of the phrases you use is conflict entrepreneurs um, in, in the course of the book. Can un unpack that, because it seems like that's part of the dynamic that you know, that we, uh, that we need to talk about whether we're talking about this country, you know, whether we're talking about global situations, I mean, we're talking about eth ethnic cleansing and talking about genocide right now and witnessing what's, what's happening in, in Ukraine. Yeah. Um, so, so, so one way of thinking about this is that the, the tendency that human beings have to form these groups and to favor their members, uh, that's universal. That's always there. That's always a danger. But how dangerous that is, uh, the extent to which that drives conflict really depends on the political context. Um, so let me tell you a, a story which I think illustrates that quite nicely. Um, uh, a researcher went to study the enmity between two tribes in southeastern Africa, the Chawas and the Tumbukas. And so he went to, to Malawi and he went to a Chawa village and he said, uh, what do you think about Tumbukas? And his respondents, the people he spoke to, had a lot of prejudices. They said, oh, the Tumbukas, you know, the rituals and the dances are all wrong, and, uh, you know, they have these weird wedding rites where the newly wed couple goes to reside uh, with the, the bride's family. That's weird. They should reside with the groom's family. And, Okay, so could you ever imagine voting for a political candidate who's a Tumbuka? Or could you imagine marrying a Tumbuka? I said, no, no, of course not. No, I, I, I wouldn't do either of those things. I said, okay, let me see how Tumbukas feel about Chawas. And it turns out they have exactly the same prejudices in reverse, right? So, uh, you know, our dances and rituals are right, theirs are wrong, and obviously the newlywed couple should live with the groom's family, not the bride's family. What are they doing? Uh, no, I wouldn't marry one in a Chawa. I wouldn't vote for a Chawa political candidate. Now, it would have been very tempting to look at this and to conclude uh, that, as journalists like to say at the time of a sort of Yugoslav civil war, uh, this is a primordial hatred. Right. right? These tribes have always hated each other, they're always going to hate each other. It's very sad, nothing to be done about that. It's just sort of a fact of, of history. Right? Uh, but instead, this researcher did something clever, which is he went from Malawi to Zambia. Now, you have to know that the border between Malawi and Zambia, like so many colonial borders, is arbitrary. It's drawn on a map by somebody who's never even been to the country, right? So uh, uh, these neighboring regions are very similar, and they're just a few miles apart. But he goes to a Chawa village in, uh, in Zambia, and they're aware of the same cultural differences. Like, yeah, our rights are different, our dance are different in those ways. They can describe the differences very well. Um, but they have much more positive attitudes. They say, oh yeah, Tumbukas, I like them, I have nothing against them, they're different from us, but they're very good people. I would, I would marry a Tumbuka if I met the right person, I would uh, vote for one of the political candidates, why not? And the same when he went to a Tumbuka village in, in Zambia. So why is this, right? What explains why these two tribes are allies in one country and 10 miles further down the road, they're, they're, they're enemies in, in a different country?
Uh, and the answer has to do with politics and with conflict entrepreneurs. Uh, in, in Malawi, these two tribes together make up a large percentage of the population. And so they compete for political power. They normally run against each other in elections. And so if you're a Malawi political candidate uh, and you're a chewa, you're going to say, well, how do I drive turnout? How do I uh, manage to uh, rile people up? How do I uh, make sure that nobody within my own group defects to, to the other group? Well, it's by telling people how terrible Chumbukas are and how dangerous they are and how we must mistrust them and all of those kinds of things. Right? In Zambia, it turns out that uh, it's a slightly bigger country and it's a more ethnically diverse country. Um, and so uh, Chawas and Tumbukas together are a relatively small percentage of the population. And so they actually are on the same side of a political divide. And so there aren't these conflict entrepreneurs trying to rile up uh, this, this sentiment against each other. And that's why they end up feeling like we're allies and we can get along. Um, uh, so yeah, I think the the role of institutions and of individual agency in figuring out uh, where the divisions in a society lie are really, really important. And that should teach us some lessons uh, when we think about some of the predictions in the United States that the country is going to become majority minority or that there's this uh, rising demographic majority for, for Democrats. Uh, I think there's a bunch of things in American politics which actually allow conflict entrepreneurs to divide us in ways that are really dangerous. So that's, yeah, you touched on a couple of things that are, I think especially interesting to talk about here in California, where, where we are already a majority mi minority state, right? Um, but, but you have, you, you kind of un unpack the terminology and talk about it in ways, I think, that um, I guess kind of qu question, question the validity of that. I mean, in, in California, the, the look at saying, you know, there are more Latinos, 39% of the population, 35% white, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, but when you unpack what, what ethnic identities are um, and political behaviors mean, um, you come to some very different conclusions than kind of the conventional wisdom when, when it comes to uh, majority mi minority status and, and for, a, for a country. Yeah, you know, I don't want to do the, the, the terrible thing of telling you about my cab driver, which is sort of a cliche of a you know, traveling public intellectual. But, um, but I arrived in SFO you know, at, at 2 p.m. today, and I, I, I took an Uber uh, into town to get to my hotel. And uh, when the very nice Uber driver arrived, I saw he had uh, a, a sort of a hat in the colors of a Brazilian soccer team, the Brazilian flag, uh, and on it it said Bolsonaro 2022. Um, <laughs> and so he was a Brazilian gentleman who's lived in, in the United States for a long time, goes back and forth a little bit. Um, we had a nice long conversation. And he is a super fan of Jair Bolsonaro. Um, uh, and unsurprisingly, one said, oh, so what do you think about American politics? Well, he's a big fan of Donald Trump's, right? Now, uh, if you know something about Brazilian politics, uh, he thinks of himself as a middle class Brazilian who actually identifies, I assume, as white within Brazil. Uh, you know, in the United States, uh, in the predominant discourse, we'd simply say he's a person of color, right. right? And that's not how he sees himself. That's not what his political experience has been. Uh, it's a really simplified way of trying to understand the sociological reality of the United States today. And if you're assuming that because he's a Hispanic who's a person of color, et cetera, et cetera, he's going to be voting for Democrats either 20 years from now or today, you're much mistaken because you know, that, that Bolsonaro had and what he said about Trump made me think it's unlikely he's going to be voting for, for, for Joe Biden in 2024, right? Um, uh, and so that's, I think, a broader lesson that's really, really important to, to take. So uh, in the United States, in the political discourse, we have this idea that America will be a majority minority. Uh, as the United States Census Bureau predicts in 2045 or perhaps 2042 or 2048, the exact year shifts, but the basic projection is treated as a scientific fact. Uh, and there's this idea that this will really uh, favor Democrats, that there's this rising demographic majority for Democrats because white voters tend to favor the Republican Party and non-white voters tend to favor the Democratic Party. I think this is the one thing that liberals and conservatives, that Democrats and Republicans can still agree on, this in, on in this country. It's one really big ambitious theory about the world that everybody seems to believe across a political divide. And unfortunately, it is not just the one thing that's absolutely wrong, um, but it's actually a very dangerous idea. So let me, let, me, let me explain why. Just empirically, I think, 
it's wrong. Um, if you'd looked at voting behavior in the 1960s, you would have said, Irish Americans, those are a really solid voting bloc for the Democratic Party. So, you know, their growth or decline will help predict how the Democratic Party does. Well, today, Irish Americans are a really reliable voting bloc for Republicans. So this stuff tends to change over time. And we're seeing a change in real time uh, at the moment. In the 2020 election, the main reason why Donald Trump was competitive is that he significantly increased the share of the vote among every non-white voter group, among African Americans, among Asian Americans, and especially among Latinos. Uh, and the only reason why Joe Biden ended up being the legitimately elected 46th president of the United States is that he significantly increased the share of a white vote relative to Hillary Clinton in 2016. So it's just very hard to predict what the voting patterns will be in, in 2044, 2048. Um, normatively, that is a good thing, right? It is a good thing for the uh, electorate in the United States to depolarize along racial lines. So I don't want to live in a country where I can look in the audience and I know exactly who you're voting for by looking at the color of your skin. That's not an appealing vision of a kind of country that we should try to build. And you know, by the way, uh, as somebody who worries about the stability of democracy, it's not surprising that I prefer the Democratic Party at this point to the Republican Party. Um, but the idea that this is somehow a politically positive vision, if in 2048, you know, Democrats narrowly win every election, but that's you know, 47% of a population. A, I'd have to vote on the other side, apparently. But, um, uh, but if there's sort of 47% of a population that feels really uh, excluded and has a lot of guns, that's not the makings of a, of a stable society. Um, so I think this whole vision is sort of wrong. But I would go even a step further. I think the very idea that America will be majority minority uh, or that California today, in a meaningful sense, is California, is, is majority minority, depends on uh, uh, accepting the one drop rule with its uh, roots in, 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 in the enslavement of millions of people, and then generalizing it beyond the African American population where it has this uh, uh, historical root to every other group. And that's not how people tend to think of themselves. We have a very rapidly growing mixed race population. Um, uh, that doesn't think of itself as just p people of color, but that actually, depending on the exact uh, nature of their parents and the nature, of, the nature of their heritage, has a much more complicated identity than that. Um, we have many uh, Hispanics, like my Uber driver today, who don't think of themselves as, as people of color in any meaningful kind of way. Uh, we have a rapidly growing Asian American population in, in California and in many other states, um, uh, who see their belonging in this country as complicated. And it's not obvious why we should think of them as naturally being part of a sociological bloc or a voting bloc alongside with uh, African Americans rather than with, with, with white voters or with white Americans. So this entire way of talking is just odd. Um, you know, uh, why should we think that an American who uh, has let's say, French aristocratic family on their father's side, let's say, and Indian Brahmin family on the mother's side, uh, you know, being at the top of their respective societies for a very long time, and then coming to the United States and being born here, and uh, I'm sure they might make some experiences with racism, and, and, and there are certain ways in which they really face discrimination. But to think that this person uh, is naturally part of this uh, you know, coherent block of people of color um, uh, and, and falls into the same category as an American who has uh, ancestors, all of whom were brought here in chains and enslaved. It's just a very bizarre way of thinking about reality. And so I think not only should political parties uh, uh, cease thinking in terms of this inevitably rising democratic majority, um, but all of us should cease thinking uh, as, as these two categories as uh, naturally given. So what's, what's the alternative? I mean, what's your, what's your positive vision? Um, well, there's, 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 there's two parts of this. So one is political. Um, I think I'm not in the business of giving Republicans electoral advice, but I think it is actually a very good thing if Republicans try to build uh, 
a genuinely uh, a cross-racial working class coalition, as some people in the party seem to be trying to do, and this to some extent seems to be happening in reality. I think that's a positive thing. Uh, and I think Democrats shouldn't give up on some of the predominantly white states that Barack Obama carried in 2008 and in many cases in 2012. So I think our politicians shouldn't uh, function as conflict entrepreneurs who are building on those ethnic divisions in order to win. They should be trying to reach every American. Uh, and actually, uh, it turns out that there's uh, you know, a lot of very progressive white people in this country and there's a lot of very socially conservative uh, so-called people of color in this country. And so um, uh, if both parties actually try to go after the electorate in the right way, um, uh, hopefully the electorate will depolarize by race more and more uh, in the coming uh, decades. Um, so, so that's one important part of this. And the second is that we don't want to build a society in which we have this fundamental division between white and non-white Americans. That is a terrible vision of the future. It is much better if we manage to build something like what the sociologist Richard Alba uh, has called an expanding American mainstream, uh, a, a society in which people can uh, continue to be true to, many, to much of a cultural heritage, in which certain forms of certainly religious solidarity, but also ethnic solidarity might continue to uh, exist, uh, but in which the fault lines of a society are much more fluid and complicated when this division into two um, mutually hostile blocks uh, might, might, might suggest. And ultimately, the goal has to be that uh, uh, our ethnic identity becomes less defining of us, less important of us, not because we close our eyes to some of the real discrimination and racial injustice that exists today, but because we manage to resolve some of it uh, so that these categories come to have less rather than more salience in the future. That needs to be the vision of what a really thriving, diverse democracy would look like. And yet it seems, I mean, like when, when you were talking about the you know, vision of a majority-minority future, you know, if, you, if you buy into that and you were going to be on the losing end, then you would want to disenfranchise voters. Uh, you would want to diminish what that electorate's going to look like. Yeah, so this is why this idea is actually dangerous, because it drives a lot of the worst behavior. So it drives, uh, especially in the on the right and the far right, uh, you know, real attacks on, on, on democratic institutions. Um, uh, in 2016, Michael Anton, who went on to be a senior advisor in the Trump White House, wrote a very influential essay called The Flight 93 Election, in which he told sort of movement conservatives why they should get aboard the Trump train. And his most important argument was that because, I quote, of the ceaseless importation of third world foreigners, end quote, um, uh, the Republican Party would never have a chance of winning and the American Republic would be in danger. And so this is our last chance, right? If we don't put a stop to this in this election, uh, we can give up, he was arguing. And so we don't know that Trump knows how to fly the plane. The plane might crash, but it's worth the risk, right? So this is what this kind of demographic panic leads to. Now, on the Democratic side, uh, it leads not just to the embrace of certain kinds of rhetoric and policy that actually uh, I think are more likely uh, to, to divide Americans from each other in ways that are counterproductive and to uh, make our identities uh, less rather than more fluid, uh, but also it leads to really bad electoral calculations. Right In 2016, uh, NPR and the New York Times and all of these news outlets said Hillary Clinton can't possibly lose because of demographics. And a lot of strategists thought, all we need to do is to mobilize our base, which they tend to misunderstand, because they tend to think that non-white voters are also uh, very progressive voters. Um, and that'll allow us to, to beat people like Donald Trump. Well, uh, actually, unfortunately, that's, that's not how it works. Um, it turns out, for example, that uh, non-white voters within the Democratic coalition are, are much more politically moderate than white voters within the Democratic coalition. And so if you want to bring them out to the uh, polls, if you want to make sure that they don't affect the Republican Party, uh, you can't simply say, uh, hey, victory is ours anyway. We just need to mobilize uh, the base, and that way we'll, uh, we'll have political power. Um, so if you're trying to make sure that Donald Trump doesn't get reelected in 2024, uh, that kind of lesson is, is important to heed. So going from kind of projecting into the future, um, 
I want to dip back into the past uh, because one of the really interesting moments in, in your book is when you, you go back to the origin of a profound American metaphor um, and, and tell the origin story of that, which I think um, many of us just don't know because, because it evolved. Um, talk about the melting pot. Mm. Um, like what, what really was the melting pot in the beginning? Where did that come from? Yeah, you know, there's these weird moments when you do research for a book, when you realize that sort of, you know, there's a sort of line in the literature and everybody sort of repeats it, uh, but nobody's actually read the thing we're talking about. <laughs> so uh, everybody says, who, who talks about uh, this metaphor of how integration might work in the United States, um, uh, you know, this idea of a melting pot comes from a play by Israel Zangweiler uh, that's, uh, you know, that premieres in Washington, D.C. in 1905. Um, and then we go on to criticize the ideal of a melting pot, and, 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 and I agree with some of the criticisms, for um, uh, designing an image of, of American society that's uh, too homogenizing, for asking people to sort of give up too much of a particularity. And I think there's something to that. I'll come back to that. But you go back to the play, and it actually has a really quite inspiring vision of America, which was, has sometimes gotten lost. Um, so it tells the story of uh, a, a, an immigrant uh, called David uh, who uh, suffered terrible pogroms. Um, he survives, but most of his family is killed by uh, essentially Russian, Russian soldiers. Um, and he is a composer who's very talented. He comes from the United States and he wants to uh, write the great American symphony that expresses for the first time the sound of a new American man. Uh, and he falls in love with a woman who, who, who helps him stage the symphony and who helps him sort of uh, settle in America, who's the daughter of a Russian baron who's run away from her family because she has these social ideals and so on. And they become engaged and they're very happy and in love. And then her father turns up to stop her from marrying a Jew. Uh, and it turns out uh, that he is, in fact, the commanding officer of the unit that has killed his family. He, has these nightmares of his, of his face um, uh, throughout the play. And when he shows up and, and where he is, uh, he has the butcher's face. Um, and so he breaks off the engagement um, because he thinks he can't marry the daughter of a person who's responsible for the murder of his family. And the, the symphony premieres, and it's a great success. And you know, it's clear he's going to have a great career as a, um, as a composer. Uh, but he flees to the roof of a concert hall and, and is terribly depressed uh, because he feels that he's failed in his vision, that his symphony is expressing this new American man that m melts away all the ancient hatreds. Uh, but he's not, he hasn't been able to be true to that in his own life. Uh, and his, uh, his ex fiance comes to congratulate him, and they reconcile. And at the end of a play, uh, he finds this moral strength to say, uh, this history will not stand between us, and we will build a life together despite all of that. So I think that the melting pot actually does have this really powerful vision, which isn't ahistorical and unaware of historical conflict and unaware of the difficulties of, of this kind of project in the way that it's often talked about. It actually is rooted in an understanding of uh, uh, how morally demanding this kind of idea is. And I think it's something that we should uh, uh, connect to something that we should admire. What, what uh, David and Vera do is, is something that, that deserves our great admiration. But I also think that it's not the right model for what you can expect of everybody. Um, uh, and that the idea of a melting pot was later used in American history um, to basically ask, to set, tell people, look, we're going to build this American culture which bears the influence of these different kinds of cultures sometimes in slightly impoverished form. So you know, we'll have spaghetti with meatballs, and we'll have Kung Pao chicken. Um, but you know, Italian Americans and Chinese Americans and so on will basically be the same uh, 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 going forward. And that is asking too much homogeneity. It's asking people to give up too much of a cultural heritage. So I, so I, so I agree with criticisms of this as this kind of metaphor for what our society should be like. Now, often that's led to a sort of counter metaphor, uh, an alternative which is the salad bowl of a mosaic. Um, and that, I think, is also mistaken, because that uh, implies that we're no more than uh, a group of groups or an association of associations. It implies that we will have these completely separate groups living next to each other, and 
we're kind of bound by a common set of rules to some extent, um, but there's really no commonality that we're going to have. It's going to be no connective tissue within our society. And that, I think, is also an impoverished vision of what the country might look like, and, and a dangerous one in terms of keeping the peace over a long period of time. And so I end up suggesting uh, a third kind of metaphor, uh, which is that of a public park. Uh, and the idea of a public park is that uh, you know, if you and I want to continue this conversation uh, after this event and the weather is nice, we can go to, uh, to a public park near here and say, we're just going to stay among ourselves and have this conversation. But we might also end up being in conversation with other people. Uh, we might end up uh, chatting with, with other people and making these new kinds of connections. And uh, both of those things are our right to do, right? Um, but we might have a preference for a public park in which sometimes these new connections do happen. And that, I think, is the right metaphor for society at large. It's perfectly fine for many Americans to choose to remain within their own groups, to say the most important thing for me is my cultural group or is my religious group, and I really don't particularly want to have close contact with anybody uh, outside of it. I'm going to live a life that is, in that respect, relatively insular. That's, that's one of the rights that you have as an American citizen, and that's perfectly fine. But if everybody did that, if everybody just stayed within their groups, if we didn't have a real dialogue, real communication between members of different groups at all, that I think would be a really impoverished vision of our country and, and, and quite a dangerous one. And so uh, that's why I think neither the melting pot nor the salad bowl quite work as these metaphors. Um, something like the public park might work better. So I think it's telling that it's a public park, right? I mean, this sort of it presumes that there has to be buying into the sense of the public good. Um, mm. We are at the Commonwealth, Commonwealth Club. Club, right? Um, finding, finding, um, and being committed to some public good. And so how are we, how are we going to make sure there is that space um, for us to, to come together? Um, you know, years ago, there was the, the writer Bahardi Mukherjee did a, a slight, uh, a variation on the melting pot. Uh, she talked about the fusion vat. Um, which was more about f the, the country being transformed, the fusing, fusing together of the different, different identities. Um, and and she, she spoke here in, in, in the past as well. Um, since you talked about the, um, the, the pogroms, um, I was wondering if we can, can go back to Ukraine, which is where your, your grandparents are, are from originally. I don't know if a lot of folks realize that, that they were um, on both sides, both all, all born uh, near Lviv, yeah. right? Um, which at the time was part of the Habsburg Empire. Uh, right, yeah. So it would have been Lvov in Polish or Lemberg in, in German, right? I mean, sort of the, the shifting, shifting I identities. Um, one of the, obviously, with the, with the fighting that's going on in Ukraine right now, with the, the invasion that's um, taken place, I think one of the things that's been part of the conversation here in the U.S., um, on, uh, in a positive way has been the, the inspiration, um, and not only the US, the inspiration that Ukrainians have offered, um, and the kind of patriotism that um, Ukrainians seem to have found. Patriotism is something you talk about in this book, um, and, and different kinds of patriotism, not, not just in the face of war. I mean, where it obviously it's, it's an existential matter, right, for, for Ukraine now. Um, but that there is, a, there is something, something to be said for patriotism. Uh, that's definitely one of the cases that you make in this book. Yeah, so look, I'm, I'm a German Jew, so patriotism does not come naturally to me, right? All right. Um, but a few things have started to change my mind about that and have started to drive home the importance of, of patriotism to me. Um, you know, one is seeing in the last decades that the kind of hope that I grew up with, that patriotism and nationalism would disappear completely from the political scene, uh, has turned out to be very naive. And that often when decent people didn't speak to patriotism, it was the most dangerous and the worst kind of people who uh, appropriated those symbols for themselves. It's interesting, I'm, I'm just thinking of, of this baseball cap that my Uber driver had displayed in his car, um, which was, as I'd mentioned, sort of in the colors of a national team. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and he did that. He would always go in the, Bolsonaro in the campaign would always wear the, the uh, you know, Brazilian football shirt and so on. Um, so if you leave this really powerful symbolism of a nation to extremists, that makes them much more powerful. 
And that's a real, real danger. Um, so that started to change my mind. And then uh, things like the example in, in Ukraine changed my mind as well. I mean, we're seeing millions of people voluntarily joining the Ukrainian army uh, to defend their country uh, against this terrible uh, invasion, against this terrible aggression. Uh, and, and that shows that uh, in the worst moments, uh, patriotism can be a really positive and inspiring force. It can be the thing that motivates people to stand up for their ideals and to defend their homeland, and that is a positive thing. Now, it depends, of course, what kind of uh, version of patriotism we're talking about, because Vladimir Putin would also claim to be a mm. patriot, right? And so, for me, there are sort of uh, a number of historical ways of thinking about patriotism, some of which are more appealing than others. Uh, so one is an ethnic form of nationalism, right, which says that uh, a, a true German, a true Italian, a true American is one who has grandparents and great-grandparents and great-great-great-grandparents who already lived in that country, or perhaps one who belongs to the majority ethnic group. Um, and that, of course, is something that I reject, um, that neither has uh, a normative significance. Um, I don't think that just the fact that um, uh, you know, your great-great-great-grandparents belong to some kind of ethnic tribe together should motivate why you treat each other differently today. Uh, nor is it actually empirically uh, uh, accurate in terms of how people now think about themselves. Um, not just in the United States, but in most democracies, including in Western Europe, where that used to be different, a majority of citizens now recognizes that they have true fellow citizens whose roots are in different parts of the world. Um, so ethnic nationalism uh, should be rejected. The second kind of conception is a civic or constitutional patriotism. Uh, and as a relatively new mint American citizen, uh, that speaks to me in a deep way. I was proud in the spring of 2017 uh, to swear to defend the constitutions and, and the laws of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Uh, one of the things that made me proud to become an American was my love of the Constitution and of uh, the Bill of Rights and the Declaration of, of Independence. Um, but I also worry that civic patriotism is a little uh, simplistic mm. in its description of uh, what patriot patriotic sentiment actually feels like. Um, one objection I have against it is, is kind of a little bit philosophical, and it's that patriotism always has to be the love of something uh, specific. It doesn't have to mean, if you're an American patriot, it doesn't have to mean you have to dislike other countries, but it does mean that there's something special you feel about your own country. Um, but political values are, uh, thankfully, uh, not that different between the United States and many other countries in the world. There's many constitutions in the world that are somewhat similar to that of the United States. Um, and even if uh, Austria or Australia tomorrow adopted the United States Constitution word for word, none of you would start to be Austrian or Australian patriots. And so constitutional patriotism doesn't quite explain what's going on here, I think. And more broadly, uh, when most people say they love America or they love a country, they're just not thinking about politics. Most people don't care about politics enough to uh, come to a lecture about diverse democracies uh, when the sun is shining outside on a you know, uh, lovely Tuesday evening. And so um, to say that patriotism is just about the Constitution, I think, just doesn't, isn't true to how most people feel. And so I think that we need to add something. We should keep civic patriotism as an important element of, of, of what national sentiment means. And it explains why, for example, those sadly relatively few Russians who have been protesting against the war in the last months are true patriots. Right? Because they're saying, not in our name, not in the name of our nations. That's an act of true patriotism, to criticize your country sometimes when it needs criticizing as well. So we need civic patriotism, but we need something else as well. And to me, that is uh, an everyday cultural patriotism. Um, but which I don't mean sort of uh, glorifying the past. I don't mean uh, you know, walking around dressed like uh, the people who walked down uh, uh, from the Mayflower uh, uh, you know, 400 years ago. Um, it means appreciating uh, what makes up a country today. I think when most Americans say that they love a country, they mean its cities and its landscapes, its sights and sounds and smells, um, its uh, cultural scripts, the way we interact with each other, the way we speak with each other, its celebrities, even silly things like its TikTok stars. Um, 
and and that is a culture which is forward looking which is ever changing which is dynamic and which in a very natural way reflects the ethnic and 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 cultural diversity that makes up the united states and makes up many other democracies in the world today as well um, and that, I think, is what people tend to have in mind when they say they love their country. And it's something that is a real strength of, of many diverse democracies today. And it's something that, uh, that we should embrace and, and, and recognize more than we tend to. So here's one of the, one of the questions from the audience. Uh, do you believe we're in the uh, midst of a period of po political realignment? Do I believe that we are? Yes, I, I, I think we probably are. Um, moments of political realignment are, are, are very confusing, um, uh, uh, but that does seem to be the case on at least two dimensions. So the first is that, um, you know, if you had been, if I'd been tasked uh, 30 years ago, let's say, with figuring out who somebody votes for, and I wouldn't have been allowed to ask them demographic questions, or I wouldn't have allowed, uh, been allowed to ask them, do you like Democrats or Republicans? Um, but I would have been allowed to ask them about one kind of policy stance. Mm -hmm. I would have probably asked something like, would you rather have a bigger welfare state and pay higher taxes or sort of less generous welfare state and pay lower taxes? And broadly speaking, the people who said they wanted a bigger welfare state would have voted for Democrats, and the people who said they would rather pay less taxes would have voted for Republicans. Today, that question doesn't tell you nearly as much about who somebody is voting for as it would have done 30 years ago. Uh, and a much better question might be something along the lines of, um, do you think that immigration is mostly an opportunity or mostly a risk for the United States? Or any, any set of other kinds of uh, uh, more social and cultural questions. Those tend to be at the beating heart of politics today. Those tend to de decide whether you're going to vote Democrat or Republican. So that's an interesting uh, moment of of, of realignment. But then there's a broader sort of set of realignments, um, including the ethnic coalitions of different political parties, which I think can be an opportunity. Um, uh, and of course, in uh, the socioeconomic base of political parties. Right? It used to be that more affluent, more educated Americans tended to vote for the Republican Party, and working class Americans tended to vote for the uh, Democratic Party. Now, the, the Democratic Party, and as Thomas Piketty shows, uh, left-wing parties in many countries around the world, uh, have become uh, the party of uh, highly educated urban elites. Um, uh, and uh, right-wing parties have become working-class parties. Uh, and that's a very odd moment of, 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 of realignment. Um, now, I think that there I have an ambivalent feeling about it, because mm -hmm. the positive thing about this is that if a Republican Party really does become the party of a multiracial working class, uh, or, or in ethnic terms, that is an improvement, I think, um, because it, it pushes us away from this ethnic polarization. Now, in, uh, on the negative side, I think as somebody who's uh, always thought of myself as, as being on the left and so on, there's something really historically perverse if the main left-wing parties just become the parties of, excuse us, excuse me, all of us in this room, uh, of, you know, relatively, I don't want to stereotype the audience of a Commonwealth Club, but, you know, of relatively educated, affluent people leading comfortable life in the big cities. That's not the historical mission of, of the left, and I think there's something sort of really perverse when, when the left becomes defined by that. And so uh, there's some opportunities in this realignment, but there's also real risks in this realignment. Having, having done a book for the centennial of the Commonwealth Club, I also know how the arc of the, the audience and the perception of it has shifted over, oh, the, over the years. There was certainly a time when, I believe it was Juan Williams who said, you know, the Commonwealth Club where Democrats receive little more than cold stares most of the time, right? Well, and California, of course, has changed uh, how it votes uh, more, more than people expect. And this is another thing that's interesting. Um, People always think that electoral maps in the United States are sort of cast in stone, you know, that like they know which, country, which states are sort of safe for Democrats or Republicans and which are the battleground states. But it's really interesting to just look through map after map after map after map, you know, uh, from presidential elections one after the other, and you see how much it shifts over time. Uh, and I think that's going to continue to shift. Uh, in the United States. It's not, not at all clear to me that states which now seem solidly Democrat are going to be solidly Democrat in 15 years and, and vice versa.
So here's an audience member who wants to know, how does religious fanaticism drive conflict? It's a big question. It is a big question. Um, well, let me say a few things about that. I mean, one is that as somebody who's not very religious myself um, and wasn't grow, grow, brought up in a religious way, um, I sort of thought that secularization would be a very good thing. Uh, that religion drives all of these terrible conflicts, and obviously we see that in, in, in the Middle East, we've seen that in European history for many centuries, we see that in many parts of the world. And so if only people became less religious, they might become more tolerant, they, become, they might become uh, more mutually understanding. Uh, and I started to feel a little skeptical about that prediction, because one of the things that religion does also give people is, is a set of moral standards, is a community to which they're connected, is a stable theology uh, which, which helps to structure uh, uh, how they behave. Uh, and I think in the United States, one of the really pernicious things in the last decades have be, has been the, the secularization of society um, or the form of the secularization of society has taken, which in many cases has meant that um, you know, people uh, have lost touch with the community. I think it's very connected with the opioid crisis. Uh, right, a lot of the people who, who suffer most from the opioid crisis are people who uh, really don't have community links at all anymore, and who take opioids in part to switch themselves off. Um, there's this really interesting observation by Andrew Sullivan that uh, the, 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 the crack epidemic and, the, um, uh, and other drugs of the 80s and 90s, including you know, LSD and, and, and ecstasy and so on, they tend to be uppers, so they tended to be, I want to go partying with people. I mean, it has horrible effects in the long run, of course, right? But they were actually social drugs. The opioid academic is downers. They're lonely drugs, right? They're like, I'm sitting in front of a TV and I'm feeling lonely or I'm feeling depressed and I just want to switch off my mind for 12 hours. Um, uh, and I think that has something to do with the decline of religiosity in the United States and the decline of those kind of communities. And then you see uh, the rise of kind of azatz religions, right? Uh, uh, some of the people who used to have uh, some kind of stable theology within the church now believe in QAnon and things like that. So I think uh, religious conflict can be terrible, uh, but secularization is not necessarily uh, an answer to that. So that's one kind of uh, uh, way of answering the question. But another thing I want to say is that uh, uh, I have a part of a book where I talk about um, uh, something that, that Francis Fukuyama, who I know is going to be a guest here in a couple of weeks, speaks about very, very well. Um, you know, the basic uh, uh, justification of philosophical liberalism as the right uh, uh, basis of our society. Um, so, you know, the fundamental question we have to ask is how do we mediate between the level of a state, the group, and the individual? Uh, and, and one part of this is important but obvious. It is to say, well, we need to protect people from the oppressive power of a state, which has gone so horribly wrong in history so many times, uh, and from the tyranny of the majority, uh, which is particularly scary if you're part of a minority uh, ethnic group or a minority religious group. Right? So I need to know that I'm able to criticize the president, but also that I'm able to engage in forms of worship uh, that might be really unpopular um, without having to fear either the state locking me up or a majority of my neighbors coming and saying, how dare you do this, we're going to beat you up, or whatever horrible thing might happen. But there's also a second kind of uh, freedom that we need. Uh, and that is the freedom from, from what Dan Asimoglu and James Robinson have called the cage of norms. Because actually in history, many times, uh, the people who uh, really made you unfree were not members of a different group, or members of a state, or agents of a state. It was your own group. It was your own parents, your own auntie and uncle, your own religious authorities, your own priest, your own rabbi, your own imam. Um, and so the sec a second kind of liberty that we really need to preserve is uh, liberty from the oppression by your own group. And the only philosophy that can do that is the philosophy of, of liberalism. Because what it says is that um, we recognize the importance of religion. We recognize the importance of groups. And that is why uh, we give you individual rights, like the freedom to worship, like the freedom to assembly, which protects your ability to be a member of those groups. But we also recognize 
but it's individuals rather than groups that are the fundamental building block of our society. Because if you want to leave your group, or if your group coerces you in some kind of way, then it becomes the obligation of a state to step in and to ensure that you can live in a self-determined way. And so I think if you have that in place, that can help to uh, regulate religious conflict. Because it means that, uh, as has mostly been the case in American history, this huge variety of religious groups can say, hey, I might not like what you're doing and, and what worship you engage in and the fact that you're not, you haven't seen the light. Um, but you know what? I get to live as I, as I want. And that's important. And we're making sure that no group ends up being so oppressive towards its own members that uh, citizens are subject to its, uh, to its coercion. And having those two things in place, I think, can help to manage conflict between religions mm -hmm. and help, can help to make sure that citizens are truly free, even as religious groups flourish. So you also, you, you mentioned, at least in, in passing, you mentioned, mentioned Robert Putnam and social capital, um, but a particular kind of um, social capital, bridge, bridging social capital is being particularly important. Uh, can, can you talk about that? Why, why the bridging? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So um, uh, one other story I tell in the book is um, of, of two cities in India uh, that are very similar to each other, both about two-thirds Hindu and one-third Muslim. Um, but one of them ends up experiencing uh, a lot of uh, uh, what Indians call intercommunal violence, which is to say riots and pogroms with, with really terrible uh, uh, consequences. Um, and the other city has ma mostly managed to avoid them. And so why is this the case? What makes the difference between these two places? And it turns out that both of them have a lot of social capital. So both of them have a lot of associations and clubs and trade unions and uh, other things that political scientists have often thought is very good uh, for uh, what a local place is like. But there's this crucial difference that in one of them, uh, there are separate clubs and associations and trade unions for Muslims and for Hindus. And so when there's a moment of high tension, uh, rumors can spread very easily within these groups, and there's no kind of counterbalancing mechanism. And so then you get all of these conflicts. Whereas in the other city, um, most of these clubs and associations are integrated. You have Hindus and Muslims who are members of them. And as a result, in moments of high tension, when one group says, you know, oh, I hear that, you know, um, Muslims have lynched uh, a Hindu boy and uh, you know, we should go and take revenge. You have people who trust each other who can say, no, 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 we, we didn't do that, that is untrue, that is a rumor, uh, let's do something together to stop this from escalating. And so these kind of bridging forms of social capital are really important and they're really important in our society. It's one of the reasons why in this public park metaphor we need the connective tissue, we need some people who engage with each other, even if it's okay that other people might, might not. Um, you know, there's another finding that I talk about in the same chapter that is interesting, which is about uh, uh, what's called intergroup contact theory. Mm. So it turns out that uh, one way to reduce prejudice is to have uh, contact with members of a group against which you might have prejudices. And there's lots of very good evidence of this. In the 1950s, in uh, housing projects in Boston, uh, uh, white Bostonians who had black neighbors uh, ended up having much more positive views about African Americans than white Bostonians who uh, uh, were assigned to uh, uh, segregated housing units. But there's really important conditions on when this works, which are also important to keep in mind. And that is that you have to have uh, equality within the group in that context, but you have to have a common purpose um, uh, that you have to have encouragement to see each other as allies rather than as enemies. You have to have all of those kind of basic conditions in place. Um, and that I think is an important thing for pedagogy. Um, so a lot of elite private schools around the country now mm. take kids at the age of 10 or eight or sometimes six and put them in these different uh, uh, sort of affinity groups. So there's teachers coming in saying, you're Asian American, you're African American, you're Latino, you're white, you're gonna go into these separate groups um, to discuss about challenges you experience and to sort of give you a political self-understanding. Now, I understand where that comes from because many of these kids do experience real forms of discrimination and racism and so on, but I worry that this completely uh, 
misapplies what we know about human psychology, but it precisely encourages these kids to say, this is my group and I'm gonna treat members of it better and discriminate against members of the out group, right? If kids uh, do that along the lines of whether they believe that a hot dog is a sandwich or not, they're definitely gonna do that if we take kids in these elite private schools and say, this is the white group and we're gonna talk to you as the white group, the idea might be to turn them into anti-racists, but I think it's more likely to turn them into racists than into anti-racists. Um, what's much better, if you uh, trust the research, which is a very deep research program on intergroup contact theory, is something much more classic. Put them on a sports team together. Right? So you have common interests. You identify together as members of this arbitrary group of a sports team that's competing against the other sports team, but within that you're, you're equal and we're encouraging you to see each other as peers to compete together for this goal. And that is much more likely, I think, to lead to real conversation, to real mutual understanding, um, and then hopefully to better political outcomes. And actually, so it's funny, you mentioned mentioning sports, and you've talked about sports and sports crowds in connection with your mother, which has a very different, had a very diff different impression of what, what sports are and, what, uh, and the dangers of them. Yeah, so, uh, you know, when I was growing up in Munich, I was a fan of Bayern Munich. Um, we're really growing up in the center of town, and so often on game days, there's these, you know, groups of fans uh, walking down the street, and, and, and this always made my mom very, very nervous. Because I think she recognized this groupishness as one of the motives of terrible conflict, and to her it reminded her of the Holocaust, it reminded her of World War II, it reminded her of all the terrible things that human beings can do to her. So, so she would sort of, when I was little, make me cross the street when we saw these sort of fans coming the other way. And um, I understand that concern. Groups can turn violent in these kinds of ways. Um, but I also have made my peace with the fact that we're never gonna be able to get rid of groups entirely. So the mission for America, for example, is not to say, how do we overcome groups entirely? How do we have a melting pot where we just think of each other as individuals that are sort of equal to each other? That's not going to work. What we should think of is, how do we have a multiplicity of group identities? How do we have group identities that uh, don't drive us into deep conflict? Mm -hmm. How can I say that, uh, you know, uh, I might be, you know, have a, connection to Mexico culturally, and that's important to me. Uh, but I also have a particular religion, perhaps I'm Catholic, perhaps for some reason I'm Muslim, and that's important to me. Um, and also, I'm an American, and that's important to me, and that, that connects me to people who have a different color of skin, who have a different kind of uh, religion. And so I think the, the ideal is to create a society in which we're going to have these different thriving groups. Um, Many people will identify strongly with a cultural heritage, will identify strongly with a religious faith, will identify perhaps, in some cases, strongly with ethnicity. Um, but they also have points of commonality with most of their fellow citizens. They also have a common identity as Americans. They also have a way of saying, even as we recognize those differences, there's something important uh, that we have in common and that unites us. This, so I have to say, as just in coming back to sports teams, since I'm from Chicago originally, I grew up as a Cubs fan, um, and and for years I had the, the feeling that rooting for the Cubs was like rooting for world peace. Right? It <laughs> wasn't necessarily ever going to happen, but it was the right thing <laughs> to do. Um, someone online wants to know how can the left project a more optimistic, inclusive message that reflects American tradition. Hmm. Um. Well, let me talk perhaps a little bit about the reasons for, for optimism, which are, which are important, right? Mm -hmm. So um, one of the weird things at the moment is that you have a fashionable pessimism which often unites the right and, and parts of the left. So when it comes to an issue like immigration, um, you know, California has a lot of immigration, you have people on the far right who will basically say, um, you know, Italian and Irish immigrants 100 years ago worked out well, because of uh, the cultural similarities to the majority group in the United States, or perhaps even because they were somehow ethnically different. And immigrants who are coming to the country today from El Salvador and Mexico and Vietnam and Kenya and other places, they're, the far right says, not going to succeed, and they're not succeeding, because there's supposedly something inferior about them. 
uh, culturally or even ethnically. Now, a lot of the left is going to reject rightly that attribution of blame and say that's, that's, that's ridiculous, there's nothing inferior about people coming from those countries, but it'll actually echo a lot of the pessimism. What I hear from a lot of my friends is, well, it's true that Irish and Italian immigrants could succeed 100 years ago because they were white, and these new groups of immigrants today that are non-white uh, are discriminated against in such extreme ways that they're never going to succeed. And so, you know, the current state of America is, is, is deeply unjust and there's not going to be any progress. Now, there is discrimination and there is injustice and we have to be upfront about that. But uh, the best studies actually show that immigrants today from all of those countries are rising the socioeconomic ranks, are gaining higher degrees, um, are making more money at about the same rate as Italian and Irish immigrants did a century ago. Uh, often in the first generation, opportunity is limited. Perhaps even language acquisition can be limited. But the generations of the children, the grandchildren of immigrants uh, are succeeding at about the same speed as the children and grandchildren of Irish and Italian immigrants did 100 years ago. Now that obviously shows, unsurprisingly, that the far right is wrong to say that there's something inferior about the immigrants coming to our country today. Uh, but it also shows that my friends on the left are uh, too pessimistic when they say that there's just no chance for them to succeed. And so that's just one little important point where there can be a kind of addiction to just talking about the negative sides. And, and I understand that, right? Because you want to have open eyes about the injustices we see in, in, in the country today. And you ha want to have open eyes, uh, you want to open eyes about what we need to do to make the country more just. And all of that is fine. But when that leads to an unwillingness to recognize that we've made progress, then we don't have a positive vision of a future to offer. And that's when it becomes easy for the far right to win. Because when you have a competition between a vision of a future that's really pessimistic and you get to blame others, or it's a vision of a future that's really pessimistic and you have to blame yourself, well, it's easier to blame the others. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, uh, this goes back to uh, what I was saying earlier, that if you start with naivety about the project of building these diverse democracies, it's easy to fall into deep fatalism. But when you start with a recognition of how difficult it is, how cruel American history has been, how cruel the history of so many other diverse societies has been, if you recognize the fact that 30 years ago, a majority of Americans thought that interracial marriage was immoral, then you can also see that we've made tremendous progress in the last decades. You can see that America today is a much better place than it was 50 or 25 years ago. You can celebrate the fact that now the number of Americans who think that interracial marriage is immoral is down to the single digits. But we used to have about one in 33 newborns for interracial. Now we have about one in seven, or one in six, according to some statistics. Uh, that the situation of African Americans has significantly improved over the last uh, 50 years. And so, um, you know, the way to uh, have uh, a more effective political message on the left is to be true to our universalist values, um, to be forthright in our condemnation of injustices that exist, uh, but also forthright in our celebration of the progress we've made, and to embrace a vision of a future that most people would actually be excited to live in. And yet there's, I think it's in, is it in The, the People Versus Democracy, your, your previous book, where you point out that among older Americans, um, many more believe in the importance of living in democracy, whereas among millennials, it's a dramatic drop off in terms of the, um, the stress of importance of living, living in a democracy. Yeah, um, so look, I think that uh, some of it has improved because younger people can now recognize the importance of living in a democracy because they feel it is threatened in a way that wasn't true uh, a few years ago. Um, but yeah, this is one of, you know, I talk a lot about demography as in destiny, but age isn't destiny either. So there's always this idea that the left has in Britain and the United States that you know, young people are much more progressive than older people. And so you know, once older people die out and the young people are in the majority, then everything will be great politically. That never pans out because people become a lot more conservative as they age. Uh, and the nature of political debates change and so on. So 
uh, certainly I think you can't just say, oh, everything will automatically become better. Um, I also worry a lot about the political sphere, right? So my last book was about the danger of the Diviso Fortan populist post to democracy. And now uh, uh, my new book is about how to build diverse democracies. And the message of the last book was relatively pessimistic. The message of this book is relatively optimistic, and that can seem like a contradiction. Um, but it's not, because uh, two things have changed. The first is uh, the, the conventional wisdom. Mm -hmm. When I wrote the last book, the conventional wisdom in my field in political science, as well as in the public, was you don't have to worry about the future of American democracy at all. You can fast forward by 25 or 50 years, and America will, will, will always be a democracy. There's just no reason for concern. And that was a deep mistake, because American democracy uh, is under threat, because you can never assume the democratic systems will endure in that kind of way. Um, but now we've gone too far in the other extreme. We've gone into saying American democracy is definitely going to collapse, or it's, it's, it's so dark that there's no, no progress to be made. And, um, uh, uh, and I think that's also overly pessimistic. So partially I'm, I'm responding to the change in the, in the conventional wisdom. But the other way of putting it is that I'm actually quite optimistic about the changes in the heart of American society in the last decades. I think America today, when you actually look at what the country is like sociologically, when you go into the heart of a country, um, when you look at how much more diverse the top echelon of American society is, when you look at how much more tolerant Americans are on average, uh, it is clearly a better country than it was 50 or 25 years ago. When you look at the political level, it's really, really screwed up. And I continue to worry very much about the 2024 election, about the 2028 election, about uh, uh, the way in which uh, Donald Trump is trying to undermine the process of certification of the election, about what he would do if he was re-elected to office. Um, so one way of thinking about the current state of American politics is that there's this terrible uh, uh, cultural civil war of the American elites, um, which might be imposed on the rest of society, in which case we really might fall apart. Um, and we need to use the strength of our society and the positive developments in our society to build a positive vision that's going to allow us to, uh, uh, to ensure that this doesn't happen. So here's an audience member that uh, offers this. Can you imagine a major transformative project over three to five years to reform our politics and governance instead of incremental reforms or a slow change in values? A collaborative society-wide project done well could bring us together. So uh, I talk a little bit about the chapter 10 problem in, 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 in this book. Um, so the chapter 10 problem, with, with all due respect to uh, all the other uh, distinguished invitees at the Commonwealth Club, is probably true of at least half of the people who speak here, right? Uh, and certainly half of the great uh, nonfiction books that are published. And it's basically that for nine chapters, or for you know, nine tenths of a presentation, you explain some deep problem in the world. Uh, and explain uh, you know, why it's important, why it's urgent, why it's really hard to, to deal with. Um, and then uh, you say in the 10th chapter, hey, here's the solution, right? Here's what we're going to do about all of this. And that solution goes wrong nearly always in one of two ways. Uh, either it says, uh, here's the three little incremental things that we might be able to get done. And you think, yeah, perhaps we can do two out of those three things, even though our politics is so screwed up. But those are far too little for us to actually be effective, right? It's not going to solve the scale of a problem. Or you say, hey, here are the absolutely radical changes we're going to make in order to solve a problem. And then you say, look, yeah, perhaps if we make all of these absolutely radical changes, we might be able to solve this problem. But A, it probably leads to other problems. And B, I know what Congress is like. This is never going to happen. What are you talking about? Right? And so I thought hard about how I might be able to avoid uh, the chapter 10 problem in this book. Um, and my answer is that you need to build on the positive changes that are actually happening in society. So I don't think that I have come up with the silver bullet that if only we pass this law in Congress, that's what's going to uh, help us deal with diverse democracies. I have a, 
uh, a friend who wrote a review of my book. It's a little strange that he wrote it because I, you know, he knows me a little bit too well to write a review, but never mind. Um, uh, uh, but he basically said, uh, you know, he writes about, you know, wh when you a hammer, everything you see is a nail, right? And so he always writes about how proportional representation is much better than our electoral system. And so he said, look, uh, you know, really this book should have said that if we only adopted a system of proportional representation, uh, that would solve the problems of diverse democracies. Um, now that came as a surprise to me because uh, the book has also been published recently in, in Germany and the Netherlands, um, which has systems of proportional representation. Uh, and when I was in Germany and benevolence, somehow nobody in the audience said, oh, this is a really interesting book, but you know we have a system, system of proportional representation, right? So this isn't a problem here anymore. <laughs> in fact, they are dealing with very similar problems, and none of them think that their electoral system is a solution to it. So I don't know whether there's a silver bullet or whether I have a silver bullet to offer. But there are important background conditions that make it easier. And some of the most important ones is to have uh, economic prosperity, it's much easier to feel uh, positively about your neighbor, uh, even if he perhaps has a bigger car than you, or his house is a little bit nice, nicer than yours, uh, and even if he's from a different group. If you feel like you're doing well and your future is going to be better, um, you have to have universal solidarity. So you have to have a, a, a welfare state um, that uh, ensures that everybody has a decent life if things go wrong, and that doesn't pit people against each other along the lines of ethnicity. Uh, you have to have an inclusive uh, uh, and effective political system. We have a sense that actually when you're passionate about something uh, uh, and you agree with the majority of your citizens, that's going to have an impact on the kind of policies that you have in your country. And you have to have a public discourse of mutual respect in which you understand that you can have reasoned disagreements about important issues uh, and that your opponents aren't just terrible human beings. Um, and so I think we can try to encourage those background conditions. But really, my optimism doesn't come from this is what Congress is going to do, uh, or this is what the Supreme Court is going to do. It comes from we've made real improvements in the last decades, and we can continue to build on those improvements to build a better society. So we have uh, we, we reached the point where we have time for just one more question. And I'd like to come back to the very beginning, um, your dedication for this book um, to friendship. Why? Hmm. Yeah, I think it's something like I, I played around with the different formulations of it, and I forget which one I ended up going with. It's to friendship, uh, civic and personal, or something like that. I think uh, something along those lines. Um, because ultimately, to make a diverse democracy work, um, well, personally, because friendship is one of the great things in life, and having a great conversation with a friend, having that mutual trust, having the ability to call each other out when you do something bad, but from a place where you know that you're always going to be there for each other. Uh, you know, that's one of the great joys in life. So there's personal friendship that I want to dedicate it to. Um, but civic friendship is, is, is just as important. Um, because we need to get to a place, and to some extent we are at a place, when a country like the United States, um, you know, uh, somebody who's Asian American in San Francisco and somebody who's uh, you know, a white steel worker in Michigan and somebody who's, uh, uh, you know, an African American uh, in, in Boston um, feel a sense of kinship with each other. Say, look, we have differences to each other. We might invest a lot of importance in our own communities. Um, but you know what? At the Olympics, we're going to cheer for the same team. And, you know, when, when the chips are down and somebody like Vladimir Putin wants to invade, uh, we're actually going to defend the values of our country and the culture of our country together. Um, and despite our differences, we actually have ways in which we're also similar. Um, and I think uh, celebrating and encouraging that kind of civic friendship uh, has to be the basis for, for making diverse democracies like the United States work. Well, our thanks to Dr. Yasha Monk, author of the new book, The Great Experiment, for joining us today. Right. The Great Experiment's available here and everywhere books are sold. We'd also like to thank our audience uh, here and our audience watching online. If you'd like to watch more programs or support the Commonwealth Club's efforts in making both virtual and in-person programming possible, please visit commonwealthclub.org slash events.
Thank you and stay safe, everyone. Thank you.